In 2 Samuel chapter 18, King David asked a most interesting question about his son Absalom. Don't go to sleep on me now. He had gone to battle with his son Absalom. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, as peculiar an event as it would be to go to battle with your own son. Let's figure out technology here. There we go. As peculiar as it would be to go to battle with your own son. When that battle was over in 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 29, David asked this question. Is the young man Absalom safe? But you see, David waited too late to ask that question. David needed to ask that question many years before he asked it. Because you know the story in 2 Samuel chapter 18 that Absalom was killed in battle. No, David, your son Absalom is not safe. David, you've waited too long to ask that question. David, maybe you should have asked that question when you went about marrying all of those different women. Maybe the the question should have crossed your mind back then. David, maybe you should have thought of this question when your son Absalom was born. Maybe you should have thought of this question as he was being raised in your home, but David, you have waited too long to ask that question. Brethren, it's a question that each of us needs to ask. Moms and dads, it's a question that each of us need to ask about our children. Is your child safe? Right now, at this very moment, is your child safe? And I'm not talking physically. I'm not asking you if you have child-proofed your home and put those little plastic plugs into the electrical sockets. That's not what we're talking about this morning. Is your child safe spiritually? There was a time when David could have done something about it, but he waited too long. Don't wait too long in your life to ask that question. Ask the question while they're still young. Ask the question while there's still something that you can do to impact whether or not your child remembers God in the days of their youth or does not. Is there any greater question that we need to ask? Is there any greater thing that we need to consider about our own children than are we preparing them to go to heaven? Are we doing all that we can in our homes to ensure that that when they leave our homes that they can be faithful Christians? Are we doing all that we can in our homes to prepare them to be faithful Christians in order that they might be prepared for eternity, in order to spend eternity in heaven? There's no greater question that we need to ask. But unfortunately, as you look at our world today, Unfortunately, as you look at our brotherhood today, it seems that more and more of our young people are ill-prepared when they leave home. When you begin recognizing the fact that we are losing our young people, when you begin to look at the fact that so many of our young people are leaving the church after they leave home, we need to understand that we're not asking that question soon enough. We need to start recognizing that we need to do a better job as parents. Brethren, think about the gravity of that statement. We are losing our young people. There have been studies that have been done. There have been articles that have been written over the last half a century in our brotherhood estimating how many of our young people we're losing. You may have seen articles written in the last 30 or 40 years, many of them years ago, estimating that we had lost about 50% of our young people. And then as the years progressed, the numbers grew. And in the 90s, some were figuring we were losing somewhere between 55 to 85% of our young people. Some people were putting about 80%. And as we draw in even to our present decade, into our present century, 
Some are estimating that we're losing somewhere between 60 and 90 percent of our young people. Go back and ask that question that David asked. When you look at these numbers, is your child safe? Are you doing all that you can to ensure that they are safe in the eyes of God? In 1998, based upon hearing these reports, based upon seeing these numbers, the elders of the congregation where I work in West Palm Beach asked that we do our own study there at Palm Beach Lakes. Requested that we go back and look at our own graduates. Here are numbers that they're saying are, are happening brotherhood-wide. Where do we fit in? What's happening with our young people after they leave home, after they graduate from high school? So in 1998, we began what was nearly a two-year process of drawing together information about 151 of our high school graduates. Going back to 1967, carrying it through those who graduated from high school in 1995, we found we had 151 graduates, those young people that were attending Palm Beach Lakes when they graduated high school and had gone on to the rest of their lives. And the elders wanted to know what percentage of those who have graduated from high school while here at Palm Beach Lakes, what percentage of those are still faithful today? You saw the numbers. You saw what others are saying about what's happening in the Lord's church in the last half a century. Our elders wanted to know where did we fit in. But even more than that, they wanted to know why. You see, having a number doesn't mean anything. Having a number that says, well, we've lost this many of our young people, that, that might stir some emotions. But if you don't know why that was the case, then the number does, and the research does you absolutely no good. And so not only did they want to know why have we lost this many young people, but they wanted to know what has caused them to leave the faith. Or if we found these many people, these many young people to still be faithful, what caused them to go on in life and remain faithful as Christians. And so not only in this study did we want to know how many were still faithful, but we included in this study eight other factors that were involved in their lives. Some of them are what we would call post-graduation factors, like did they marry a Christian and did they go to a Christian college? But for the purpose of, purposes of this lesson this morning, I want us to consider these four pre-graduation factors. Four things that were happening, that were involved in their lives even before they left home, even before they graduated. So as a part of this study, we asked these questions. When they graduated from high school, was their father a faithful Christian? When they graduated from high school, was their mother a faithful Christian? Upon their graduation, what was their youth group involvement like? Were they regularly involved in our youth program? Upon their graduation, how involved were they in the worship and the Bible study of the Lord's church? Were they regularly there in attendance at Bible study and worship or not? We wanted to know what our percentage was, but even more, we wanted to know what had caused these people, these young people, to take the path that they had taken. And so in 1999, when we had completed this study, we found that we had lost... 53% of our graduates. 47%, 71 of them, had remained faithful after leaving uh, high school, after going off on their own, but 80 of them had not. Now to you, that's just a statistic. To you, that's just a number. And it's no different than the numbers that I showed you a while ago. But to us, each of these numbers had a name. And each of these names had a face. And each of these faces had a memory. And we realized that we had lost 80 of them. Somebody says, well, that's not too bad. It could have been worse. Brethren, we lost 80 young people. If we had lost one, it would have been devastating. Because we're talking about a soul. But why did they go down this path? 
Why did 80 of them end up being unfaithful? Why did 71 of them continue to live a life and become a faithful Christian? And so we looked at all of our graduates and we lumped them all together and we considered, we took out of those, of those 151 graduates, we took out all of those who did not have a faithful father. Put them in a category and said, here are all of the young people when, that when they graduated, their father was not a faithful Christian. How did that impact their life? Well, of all of those that did not have a faithful father when they graduated, 62% of them are now unfaithful today. That's how important it is to have a faithful father. Well, what about all of those graduates who didn't have a faithful mother? We pulled together into a category all of those graduates that when they graduated, their mother was not a faithful Christian. And the number climbs to 72%. 72% did not have a faithful mother, and guess where they are now? They're not faithful. Moms, do you know how important you are to the faithfulness of your children? We looked at all of our graduates and we pulled into a category all of those who were not regularly involved in our youth program, all of those who did not make it a habit to come to the devotionals, to come to the service projects, to come to the activities of our youth group. That wasn't their habit. That was not their regular thing to do. And this number may surprise you, it surprised most that we have told it to, that now all of those who were not regularly involved in the youth program, 80% of them are now unfaithful. See, there's some that have the mindset that a youth program, well, you can just take it or leave it. It's not really that important. It's just a bunch of fun and games anyway. Brethren of our children who were not involved, 80% of them ended up being not faithful to the Lord. You can't tell me that it's not important. You can't tell me that you can take it or leave it. You can't tell me that young Christians, having fellowship with other young Christians, doesn't have an impact on their life. Even if it is just fun and games. Even if they are just in some social setting, there is such a thing as positive peer pressure. And I would encourage you to have your children involved. We looked at all of our graduates, and we pulled into a category all of those who were not regularly in attendance at Bible study and worship. And we found that 90% of them are now not faithful. The statement is often made that we're losing our young people when they go off to college statement is often made, well, when they go off to college, that's when they're falling away. Can I ask you to consider these numbers? And allow me to respectfully disagree with the statement that they're leaving when they go off to college. At least disagree with the timing of it. Because brethren, when you begin to look at these numbers, you have to understand that they were lost already. How could we expect these who were not regularly involved in the work of the church, how could we then expect them to grow into adults who would completely change their life and become faithful to God? It was not that all of a sudden they got out on their own and said, well, maybe I'll just be unfaithful to God. It was the training they received in their home that led them to become unfaithful. Can I speak to those of you who I respectfully call Sunday morning only brethren. Those of you that only come on Sunday mornings, we included that in this study. We wanted to find out what happened to those young people who grew up in a home where they only came on Sunday mornings. Didn't come on Sunday nights, didn't come on Wednesday nights. There was something more important happening that, they, that their parents wouldn't bring them. Can I speak to those of you who only come, and this is the only time you'll be here this week? How many of those do you think are now unfaithful? It's interesting that it's the very same number, 90%, SMO, Sunday morning only. 
children who grew up in those homes, 90% of them are now not faithful. I don't know about you, but that's depressing. So let's move on to those 71 graduates who are still faithful. And look at those same four pre-graduation factors and determine, did these still have an impact in their lives? What caused these 71 to remain faithful to God? How many of them had a faithful father? You look at this study and you recognize that 70% of them, of those 71 who are still faithful today, 70% of them had a faithful father. Having a faithful father in the home is priceless. But dads, before you start getting too proud, recognize how long this line is. Moms, of the 71 graduates who are still faithful today, 90% of them had a faithful mother. Mothers, you play such an incredible role in the development of faith in the hearts of your children. How many of these 71 graduates were regularly involved in our youth program? Again, this number may surprise you, but it's 85%. How important was it for young people to be around other young people that shared the same values, that shared the same Christian principles in their lives. Evidently very valuable. Here's 85% of our faithful graduates. That's what they did on a regular basis. That was their habit. That was their normal walk of life to be involved in the youth program. How many of them were regularly in attendance at Bible study and worship? I don't know what happened to the other 3%. They squeaked in somehow. But 97% of our faithful graduates were there on a regular basis. My parents used, and probably many of you used, the same terminology. We're going to be there every time the doors are open. I grew up in a home where my grandparents were the custodians of the church. So guess what that meant for my life? If every time the doors were open, we were there, guess what? Parents, may I beg of you, every time the doors are open, to have your children at Bible study. Every time the doors are open, to have your children in worship. And if you choose not to do it, the statistics show that in all likelihood they will not grow up to be faithful Christians. Ask this question again. Is your child safe? When you look at these numbers, these numbers, they may seem as statistics to you. But in the studies I've done, they seem very typical of other congregations. It seems very typical that those who are faithful after they graduate are those who have these faithful factors working in their favor before they ever leave home. What caused these 71 graduates to leave home and still be faithful? It's because they grew up in a home where there's a faithful dad and a faithful mother and they're faithfully at Bible study and worship and they're faithfully involved in the work of the church at large, but in this particular case, in in, in the youth program. What caused them to be faithful? They were faithful before they left. What caused those to grow up and be unfaithful? They were unfaithful before they left. Is your child safe? Young people, it's no wonder why Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. You know, Solomon didn't need these statistics to write Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. He didn't need to look down through time and and find out how many young people were falling away. He didn't need that. He had seen it in his own life. Here's Solomon, the son of David, the same David who asked the question, is the young man Absalom safe? The same father David who had not done such a good job in raising his own son Absalom to the point that he has to go to battle with his own son. Here's another son, Solomon. And Solomon, through his own life experience, understood what we've been talking about. 
Solomon, through his own life experience, recognized that a lifetime of faithfulness must start very young. And so he wrote a passage that's familiar to each and every one of us. Parents, would you write this verse on your heart? Young people, would you write this verse on your heart when the Bible says, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. Solomon understood what we've been talking about. And Solomon understood that a life that is being formed now as a child is going to be where that life most likely ends up as an adult. Notice the significance in time that he places. At least three different times in this one verse. Notice when he says, remember now. Don't wait. Don't say, well, I can do that later on in life. He says, do it right now. Remember God now. And then he says, remember God now in the days of your youth. Don't wait until you get old. Don't wait for those difficult days to come. He says, do it now. Do it in the days of your youth. And do it before those difficult times come. Those difficult years come. When you look upon them and you say, I have no pleasure in them. Solomon recognized that a lifetime of faithfulness begins very young. So young people, I'd like to share with you 11 different things that I would encourage you to do in remembering your Creator. And I've tried to put them together in such a way that maybe they will be easy for you to remember. Maybe perhaps an easy way for you to memorize them. If all you can remember is that in order to remember God, you need to decide young, then I think you can remember these. Young people, in remembering God in your youth, I would encourage you to decide right now that you are going to serve God for the rest of your life. Don't wait. Some of you may be wanting to be an accountant when you grow up. Some of you may want to be an, an engineer when you grow up. You think that's going to happen by accident? You think you'll wake up one day and all of a sudden you say, Wow, I'm an accountant. Boy, that was great. Glad I'm an accountant now. Any accountants in here tonight, this morning? Did schooling happen by accident? Did passing those, those exams happen by accident? What did it take? It took work. It took preparation. Young people, you're not going to wake up one day and accidentally be a faithful Christian. It won't happen by accident. Decide right now that you are going to serve God for the rest of your life and you're not going to allow anything to get in the way. Decide young that you will emphasize the church more than anything else in your life that you will put the church above everything else in your life. Is that not what Jesus told us to do in Matthew 6 and verse 33? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Young people, decide right now that that is going to be the most important thing in your life. Decide young that you are going to choose the right friends. Choose the right friends. Do you know God is concerned about the friends that you choose? In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 26, the Bible says that the righteous should choose his friends carefully. God is concerned about who you choose to be your friends. He says, here's what the righteous person is going to do. The righteous person is going to choose his friends carefully. Why? The rest of the verse says, why? For the way of the wicked leads them astray. God knew what would happen if you chose the wrong friends. And so God says, choose them wisely. Choose them carefully. But I've heard over and over, at least the words, if not the sentiment, of young people who say, yeah, but, but I'll be okay. You know, they're, they're not going to be able to touch me. 
I'm stronger than that. I'm not going to allow them to, to influence me and to change my life. You know what the first words of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 are? Be not deceived. Brethren, if we think we can go about life and not be influenced by the people that we are around, guess what? We've been deceived. We've missed the first part of 1 Corinthians 15.33. We know the rest of 1 Corinthians 15.33. We know that it says that bad company corrupts good morals. We know that it says evil companions corrupt good habits. We know the rest of it, but we forget the first part of it. All of a sudden we think, oh no God, I'll be okay. No God, I know you say that I need to choose my friends carefully. I know your word says that the way of the wicked will lead them astray, but God, I, I, that's not going to happen. And all of a sudden we have allowed ourselves to be deceived instead of allowing ourselves to do what God says. Young people, I beg of you to decide right now, decide young that you are going to choose the right friends. Three days, three days before Christmas, I think it was, maybe four. December the 22nd, I went and visited very special young man to me. Very special young man because he came to the church in his teenage years. Didn't know anything about truth until he was 14. Didn't know anything about the Lord's church until he was 14. But he came by the building and we studied. We grew close to each other. And although you may not think I'm very old, I consider him my son in the faith. Very special to me. He didn't have a father figure in his life, and so we spent a lot of time together. He was a teenager and involved in the high school and uh, senior high youth program. He wanted to be a preacher. He talked about going to school to become a preacher. December the 22nd, I went to visit him at the county jail where I had to talk to him on a phone with glass in between us. It was the first time I'd seen him in about a year. You know the first thing he said to me when he picked up the phone? David, I've been hanging around the wrong people. Choose the right friends. He knew why his life had taken the turn that it had taken. It's because of the people that he chose to hang around. And so he decided there in that jail cell that he needed to stop, that he needed to choose his friends carefully, lest he be led astray again. I saw my own sister's life nearly destroyed because of the people that she hung around. Young people, I could talk about this topic for a very long time because God is very concerned about your faithfulness. Your parents are concerned about your faithfulness. May I beg of you to be careful who you hang around. May I beg of you to involve yourself in the activities of the youth program. Get involved in what's happening. Become a regular part of it. Recognizing statistically why, why some of our own graduates remained faithful was because of the influence that the youth program had in their lives. I would beg of you to draw a line in the sand and don't get near it. When it comes to those issues that young people you are facing, probably more than most other people in this assembly this morning, when it comes to those matter of moral issues, when it comes to the matter of drinking, when it comes to the matter of drugs, when it comes to the matter of sexual conduct, Young people, I beg of you before you ever get in the situation, before you're ever faced with the temptation, to draw a line in the sand that says, I am not going to do it, and then don't get near the line. Don't creep up to it and say, well, I can probably do a little bit more and I'll be okay. I can probably go a little bit farther and I'll be all right. Draw a line in the sand and then stay as far away from it as you can. Make up your mind that you're going to serve God and you're not going to allow evil to influence your life. You're not going to allow Satan 
to overcome you in the, te- in the temptations that you face. Young people, decide right now that you are going to exemplify godliness to others. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, some translations say that, 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 uh, that they are to be an example of the believer. Some translations say to be an example to the believers, and I would encourage you to be both. Be an example of what it's like to be a believer, but at the same time come into this place and be an example to all of the rest of us of what it's like to live godly. Young people, I would encourage you to yearn to learn the Word of God. Or as Jesus said it, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Make up your mind today you're going to start reading the Bible doesn't have to be five or six chapters a day. It can be five or six verses a day. But pick up the Bible and start reading it and desire to learn. And when you do that, what's going to happen is you're going to build faith. And what I would encourage you to do is to own your faith. You're not going to get to heaven because your parents are faithful. You need to have a faith of your own. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The more you study, the more your faith grows, the more your faith becomes yours. I would encourage you to utilize resources that you have for faithfulness, especially older Christians. Young people, I would encourage you to build relationships with older Christians. Take it from somebody who has had relationships nearly for his entire life with those who are 10, 15, 20, 50 years older than I am. And still, even to this day, I consider them my friends. But yet they have no idea what kind of influence they've had on me. Older Christians, find you a Timothy to adopt and begin to have an impact on their lives. But not only that, I would encourage you to never miss worship. Never, never, never. Make up your mind, no matter what kind of home you've been raised in, that every time the doors are open, I am going to be there and then decide, young, that you are going to grow closer to God. Going to grow closer to Him through prayer. Don't let a day go by that you don't pray to God. And parents, I would encourage you not only to help your young people to have these things in their life, I would encourage you to have these things in your life. I would encourage you to decide that you're going to emphasize the church and set priorities in your home and put what needs to be first in first place. I would encourage you to live like a Christian and set a Christian example for your children even in your own home. I would encourage you to train up your children in the way that they should go. I would encourage you to bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I would encourage you to teach the Word of God to your children diligently. To teach it to them when you're sitting in the house, when you're walking by the way, when they're lying down, when they're rising up every time you have the opportunity. Allow the Word of God to impact not only your life, but to impact your entire home. Parents, it's up to you. It's up to us. These images that you have seen throughout this presentation are of two special girls in my life. It's my responsibility and it's my wife's responsibility to bring them up in order that they might be faithful to God. If I could get these lights on here in the auditorium, I would like to ask all of the young people here this morning to stand up. Whether you're 18 years old in high school or you're 18 days old, anywhere, I don't see, I guess we don't have any here today, so... Oh, well, oh, all of a sudden, they woke up. If you have to, stand on a pew so that we can see you, not you over here. I don't want to see any of you standing on a pew. (laughs) Can I ask all of you to look around? Statistically, if this congregation is just average... And I think you're above average. I think you're good. But if if this congregation is average, 
Statistics show that we will lose 50% of these kids. Can I ask you all to look around and could you choose which 50% you'd be okay with losing? Don't point fingers now, okay? You can't do it, can you? Just one. Then just make one or two. Which one or two would you be willing? Well, it wouldn't be a big deal if we lost them. Statistically, I have two girls. What do statistics say? I'm going to lose one of them. As a father, you think I can choose which one would be okay to lose? Wouldn't be a big deal if Katie or if Kelly. Wouldn't be a big deal if one of them grew up to not go to heaven. Can you make that decision? Can you make that choice? It's obvious that none of us can. Parents, may I beg of you to start doing things in your home and doing all that you can in the home life of your children to instill faith within them. We may not want to make the choice, but if we send our children out into the world ill-prepared, having not done what we should have as parents, let us not wait until David did to ask whether our children are safe or not, Let us ask it right now and do all that we can in the hearts and in the minds and the lives of each of these children to help them to remember God in the days of their youth in order that we might reach heaven without a loss of a single one. You all can be seated. This very day, we've talked about children. We've talked about our children. But this very day, you can become a child of God. This very day, through faith, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, turning away from the wrong in your life, repenting is what the Bible calls it, what God desires all men everywhere to do, Acts 17 and verse 30 and 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 to turn away from the sin in our life, confess our faith in Jesus. And then this very morning, you can become a child of God by being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27, to arise this very day and have your sins washed away, Acts 22 and verse 16. Have your sins forgiven. Have yourself added to the Lord's church, not by anyone here, but to be added by God Himself and to have your name registered in heaven, and then to live your life as a faithful child of God until the day that you die. If you're not a child of God this morning, or if you are one of His children who has not been faithful, if you need to respond to this invitation anyway, please come as together we stand and sing.